let us humble our heart. Heavenly Father, gracious King, we love you and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done, all that you helped us through, knowing, Lord, that our very day, the breath that we breathe, is because you said so. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. And you have pointed the way to do what needs to be done. It's in your word. We gather together, Lord, as often as we can, especially on the Lord's day, because you told us to. And we want to fellowship. We want to share with one another our joys, our pains, our sorrows, our hopes, our dreams. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I know you're here. You indwell us. Father, watch over us. Take over care of us. Guide us this in each day. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Welcome. Welcome all. Good to be in the house of the Lord. And this is the time when we talk about our events that are going on, and many they are. First, welcome to any visitor. Welcome those who are online. And those who are online, if you get a chance to drop in, please do. We had one from Florida last week. It was such a joy to have him here. And uh, we have a seat for you as well. There will be uh, no Tuesday afternoon Bible study this week. Uh, that will recur next week, so please be present. Shoe boxes. We will, are collecting for Operation Christmas child shoe boxes. Our September donations are wow items. What is that? Toys. Toys must fit in the shoe box. No liquids or toy weapons, please. Please put your donations under the Christmas tree. The website for the International Council of Christian Churches, ICCC. Please familiarize yourself with this preeminent organization for which we are affiliated. Our library, it's open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 12.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m., Call the office if an individual appointment is needed. Uh, talk with Bridget Wiley. Okay. Please remember to visit our additional website, God Set Eternal Life dot org. And for those who signed up next Friday, excuse me, for those who signed up next Saturday, the twenty third of September, we'll be at Friendly Farms. And our celebration begins at 11. It will be from 11 to 3. 11 to 3. And I believe that's it. Now, our scripture reading this morning is from Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now, Pastor Ron will bless us with his message, Why Jesus Became a Man. Please be seated. Peace and blessings to all of you. As we begin today in our third installment in the book of Hebrews, for those of you who like to think ahead, look ahead, I want to share with you that my mentors, when they preached the book of Hebrews, it took them two years, two years to finish. There's a lot here, a lot here to understand, like in today's topic. 
so great a salvation. So great about salvation. And then that curious question, that intriguing question, why Jesus became a man. We'll cover that today. Let me open with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right started. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to share your words. Let it touch the hearts of the hearers, Lord. And those who don't know you, may it draw them nigh. Your word, Father, will never return void. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Okay, I want to get started right away. We're in chapter 2 today. Please open up your uh, books if you have your Bibles, if you have them. We'll be in chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 1. Verse 1. And it reads, Therefore, we must pay close attention to that we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Therefore. Now, that's an interesting word, right? Used often by writers of the books of the Bible. And when I read it, I'm thinking to myself, the phrase could mean, for that reason, for that reason, or, or consequently. And simply, it simply means the writer is building on something prior, something prior, as in this case in chapter 1. Now, briefly, chapter 1 solidified for you the believer's trust in Jesus. It begins by pointing out that God does, in fact, speak to his people. In the past, this was through various prophets. Now, however, the message is primarily through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews states, by pointing out that Jesus is not an angel, he's not a created being, rather, Jesus is identical to God. Now, why would I say that? Remember back in chapter 1, verse 3. Let me tell you what it says. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. This was an especially an important distinction to make in the very early church. Why? The Jews thought that the angels would rule the world one day. According to the actual word of God quoted in Hebrews, this is not the case. The promised one, the Messiah. The descriptions given there, no angel could ever match. In fact, what the Jewish scriptures say about the Messiah makes it very clear that this figure is actually divine. Divine. Continuing on in verse 1, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. Now, this is the first of five admonitions, count them, the first of five admonitions found in the book of Hebrews. Their purpose. Their purpose is to encourage all readers to pay attention to God's word and obey it. Make a note. These admonitions, they become stronger as we progress through the book of Hebrews, starting with drifting, drifting from the God's word to defying God's word in Hebrews. That's, that'll be later in chapter 12, verses 14 through 29. Now, since Jesus is greater, you must listen to him. God the Son is talking to us, so we must earnestly listen to the Son. Our God is a game changer. Don't forget. He came down. He put on flesh. He lived among us. We must earnestly listen to the Son. Now, let me talk to you in the audience at home who had younger siblings at home when you were growing up. Maybe you had to babysit the same way I had to. And when you were babysitting, maybe you had to give them some direction. Now, I used to say, Mama said. Mama said this, Mama said that. Sometimes they listened, and sometimes they didn't. But when Mama came home, 
when mama came home, they listened. When mama talked, they listened. And the writer of Hebrews is making it clear in the text that since Jesus is greater, you must listen to him. The verse ends with, lest we drift away. Now, for you Navy guys like Pastor, that's a nautical term, drifting. The author wants the church body <clears throat> to know in not listening, you will drift away. Drifting is a slow process. In a sense, it just happens. We drift because we are not attached. It is not a sudden departure, it's by no means. It's a step-by-step -step occurrence. Not to drift is an individual choice, however. Not drifting must be intentional. And just let me ask you, are you anchored to Jesus? Are you intentional about your prayer life? And I want to take it a step deeper. Your five-year-old Bible, does it still look new? What are you reading? Have you done any underlining? Sisters and brothers, I beseech you, don't drift. You don't want to drift. Verse 2. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable. Now, here the author is using the term message, and what he's referring to is the Ten Commandments. It appears, it appears that the angels had a role in the deliverance of the law, the Ten Commandments. Let's look deeper. Turn with me, please, to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2. Verse 2. How does it read? The Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Sia upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the 10,000 of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. The 10,000 holy ones refer to, you got it, the angels. Now, I happen to prefer another reference, if you don't mind, in Acts chapter 7, verse 51 through 53. You may remember Stephen, Stephen, our first Christian martyr. These were some of his last words before he was stoned to death. And they support, they support that the angels were involved in the delivery of the Ten Commandments. And when he's speaking, he does not mince any words. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced before him the coming of the righteous one, whom you have not now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. And so if these words, the Ten Commandments, delivered by the 10,000 angels matter, how much more? Will the words delivered by the only begotten Son of God matter? Verse 2. It ends with, And every transgression and disobedience received is a just retribution. When one thinks about the transgressions, we have a situation where the perpetrator steps over the line, committing an act, an overt act of commission. Disobedience suggests the idea of shutting one's ears to God's command, thereby committing a sin of omission. But, child of God, both are willful, serious, and will bring judgment. Let's go down to verse 3. And don't miss this, please. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. 
the question the writer is asking is, how shall we escape? There is no escape. When you neglect this salvation, you are sealing your faith to the final judgment, the eternal wrath. So pay attention. As I say in the military, listen up. Jesus is the only way. There is no hope, no other name whereby you may be saved. And this was no ordinary event. This was a, a great, great salvation. Yes, it was. It was so great, so wonderful, so full, so complete. We measure the completeness and greatness of the salvation by the price paid by Jesus on the cross. He died for you. But if that were all, it would have not been enough. He also, again, conquered death. He rose again and conquered death. And remember, I told you last time, he sits at the right hand of the Father. And you might ask why. Why is he sitting down? He can sit down because his work has been done. It's finished, I tell you. It's done. It's finished. No more sacrifices need be made. Jesus has paid the ultimate price. You are sanctified. In fact, all true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who have been effectually called have been sealed, <laughs> sealed for the day of redemption. They are guarded through faith by God's power, 1 Peter. Chapter 1, 3 through 5. They will be glorified. Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. And they can never perish or be snatched <laughs> from the Father's hand. How do I know that? John chapter 10, verses 28 through 29. Let's go down to verse 4. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will, the supernatural powers demonstrated by Jesus and his apostles were the Father's divine confirmation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, his son. Let's read one supporting scripture in John chapter 10, verse 38. But if I do them, now this is Jesus talking about miracles. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, huh? believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I, I am in the Father. I am in the Father. Okay. What we've done so far, we've covered the writer's discussion of so great a salvation, and how great it is. Let's move on to this intriguing question. Why? Why did Jesus become a man? Going to verse 5. Now, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. The author is making it clear that God did not hand over the world to the angels to rule. In fact, the honor was passed to man. To man. Let's step back and take a look at Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. We'll begin at the beginning. Then G God said, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock, and over the, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So man was charged with what? The responsibility to reign, to rule over the earth, not angels. Verse 6 is interesting. This is how it opens. It has been testified somewhere. Somewhere. That sounds strange, doesn't it? It has been testified somewhere. But the author is simply saying the members of this local congregation all know where these words come from. 
And it comes from the pen of King David. Psalm 8, verse 4. And it reads, Who is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? In this psalm, David reflects upon God's majesty that is displayed in the creation. The heavens declare God's glory. Against the backdrop of such glory, man seems insignificant. Yet God chose man to rule the earth and all its creatures. By giving man this awesome responsibility, God has crowned him with glory and honor. David marveled that God would share his power and glory with feeble man. Verse 7. You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Verse 8. Putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left Nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Stop right there. I got a problem. We have a problem. We have a serious problem. For it is obvious that man today is not exercising dominion over God's creation. Seriously. Man cannot control the fish. He can't control the fowl. He's not controlling the animals. In fact, let's get real. Man can't even control himself. So how do we resolve this, I ask? The solution to this dilemma is verse 9. Let me read it for you. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by grace of God, the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus is God's answer to man's dilemma. Our Savior became man that he might suffer and die for man's sin and restore the dominion that was lost because of original Sin, original sin. When our Lord was here on earth, he exercised that lost dominion. Yes, he did. He had dominion over fish, fowl, wild beasts, and domesticated animals. And I want to prove it to you. Go to Matthew, please. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. I love the way the Bible just, just comes together to support itself. 17. I'm going to start reading at verse 24. Okay? When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea hmm, and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. My father has dominion. He also has dominion over the fowl. Yes, he does. Luke. Turn to Luke, please. Chapter 22. I'll read two verses out of that. 34, and it'll be confirmed by verse 60. Starting at 34. Chapter 22, Luke. He gives an example where Peter will deny Christ, and it reads, Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Dropping down to verse 60, how does it conclude? But Peter said, 
Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Jesus has dominion. But what about wild beasts? Wild beasts. Go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 12. The Spirit immediately drove him out. We are talking about Jesus after his baptism. Mark 1, verse 12. We're talking about Jesus after his baptism. Uh, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, count them, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him, ministering to him. Our last example comes from the book of Mark, chapter 11, verse 1 through 7, and it says, Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 7, Mark says this, now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a coat tied on which no one has ever sat. And that's important. No one had ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a coat tied at a door outside the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the coat? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let him go. And they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their cloaks on. And he sat on it. We don't have the time in this forum, but I would love to go back and show you the, the, um, what the prophet said and how this was prophesied before, what we're reading right now. Our Bible just hangs together. God's word is perfect. Now, clearly, what has happened? Jesus restored the lost dominion that was lost because of original sin. As the last Adam, Jesus Christ regained man's lost dominion. Today, everything is under his feet. Man was crowned with glory and honor, but he lost his crown. How? He lost his crown and became the slave of sin. Jesus Christ was regained, has regained that honor and glory, and believers today share and this is the part that I love so much. We get to share in his kingly domain, dominion. One day, when he establishes his kingdom, it gets better, it gets better. We shall reign with him in glory and honor. Jesus did all of this for us. He died. Don't you see? He died when you were still a sinner. God's grace is what it is. Family, this is why Jesus became a man. If he had not become a man, he could not have died and tasted death for everyone. It is true that angels cannot die, but it's also true. Angels can't save you. They don't save lost sinners. And angels cannot restore man's lost dominion. It's Jesus that does it. And there's more. Christ gave up his glory to become a man. He regained his glory when he rose and ascended to heaven. Now he shares that glory with all who trust him for salvation. And that's you. And that's me. He's bringing many sons and daughters to glory. Christ is united in us and we're reunited. In him, we are spiritually, watch this, we're spiritually one. In fact, we are his brethren. As the author tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12. Here the author is quoting, really, Psalm 22, verse 22. A messianic psalm. In which Christ refers to his church as his brethren. Think of that. My 
my brother. This means we and the Son of God share, ready, the same nature. And we belong to the same family. What a marvelous grace he has given us. Why did Jesus become a man? If Christ had not become the earth and become a man, he could not take us from earth to share in his glory. The incarnation, this, listen, the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, it's a package deal. It's all together. They all lead to glory. Jesus could not have become an adequate savior and high priest had he not first become a man and suffered and he died. Two more. By becoming a man, his humility enabled him to disarm Satan and deliver us from death. Angels don't die. Jesus did not come to save angels. He came to save you. You. This meant that he had to take on himself flesh and blood and become a man. Only then could he die. You may not have needed to know that. I needed to know that. That has been on my mind since I was a boy. He had to do that. He had to come. He had to put on flesh so he could die. And through his death, what did he do? He defeated Satan. The word destroy, though, stay with me here. It doesn't mean annihilate. For it is obvious that Satan is still alive and busy. Instead, the word means render inoperative. It means that it has no effect now. Satan is not destroyed, but he is disarmed. Finally, the humility enables him excuse me, his humanity enables him to be a sympathetic high priest to his people. Being pure spirits who have never suffered, the angels cannot identify with you guys. In our weakness and needs, no, he can't. But he can. Jesus can. While he was here on earth, Jesus was made like unto his brethren, didn't he not? In that he experienced infirmities of human nature. He knew what it was to be a helpless baby, a growing child, a maturing adult. He knew the experience of weariness, of hunger, of thirst. He knew what it was to be despised, rejected, falsely accused, lied on. He experienced suffering and he experienced death. All of this was part of his training training for his heavenly ministry of high priest. High priest. It might be good at this point to make a difference between the roles of high priest and his role of advocate. And I I want to remind you, advocate, another word for that is lawyer. As our high priest, our Lord is able to give us grace to keep us from sinning when we are tempted If we do sin, then he is our advocate, our lawyer, representing us before the throne of God. I've heard it once said that if you have a good lawyer, he knows the law. But if you have a great lawyer, he knows the judge. When Jesus talks as your lawyer to God in your behalf, Let me tell you how he starts off. Daddy, that's my, that's one of mine there. That's how that conversation starts. You want that. You want him representing you before God and forgives us when we sincerely confess our sins to him. Both of these ministries are involved in his present work of intercession. And it is this intercessory ministry that is the guarantee of our eternal salvation. 
That's why we say, you're not holding on to him. He's holding on to you. He's holding on to you. As you read Hebrews, you cannot help but be amazed at the grace and the wisdom of God. From a human standpoint, it would seem a little foolish for God to come here as a man. Yet, it was this very act of grace that made it possible for salvation and all that goes with it. When Jesus became man, he did not become inferior to the angels, for in his human body, he accomplished something that angels could never accomplish. At the same time, he made it possible for us, you and I, to share in his glory. He is not ashamed. He is not ashamed to call his brothers and sisters. And you should not be ashamed to call on him as well, to call him Lord. And I just want to close with this. The incarnation of Christ is the greatest proof of God's love and regard. Christ was sent, in, not in the form of an angel. He was sent in the form of a man. Let us pray. Father, I am so glad that we belong to you, that you took the time to go through all that you went through Birth by Mary, raised. Your brothers didn't even believe in you. Lied on, cheated, tortured at the cross. So you could conquer death and deliver us. You loved us when we were foolish. And I know there's a million stories right in this room today of the things we did. But you didn't give up on us. You walked with us, Lord. And when we turned around thinking we were lost and we looked up, there you were, reaching down. If you hear my voice and you don't know him, know that he knows you. And he's willing to accept your prayer of forgiveness. He's willing to accept the cry that you give out that says, Lord, I need you in my life, and I accept you as Lord. Thank you, Father. And as we go about our day, let us share you with those that we meet. Lord, one more thing. We wanted to dedicate this to a special person today who tried to be here, but he's still in the hospital. And for all those who need God's presence, we pray that you receive them. In Christ's name we pray, amen.